Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, that was a treat, wasn't it? Thank you. Especially those vocals, Ileana, that was awesome. You know, that tune always gets to me when I think, you know, I have nothing to give that would be suitable for a king, amen, other than a hallelujah. And, you know, coming from the heart, coming from the, the recesses of our heart. You know, it's interesting. It always amazes me when you hear music and it's coming from a place of worship. Amen? It has an effect that we can really, you know, get off the grid, if you will, of what God wants to accomplish in our lives if we're unaware that he actually wants to accomplish some things in our lives. And it's interesting to spring off of what we just had last week, of course. We had Easter Sunday, but before we had Saturday night, and Saturday night I talked about the veil that was torn when Jesus surrendered his spirit. you remember? And so the significance of the veil being torn at the moment Jesus said it was finished, the veil tore from top to bottom, giving access to the Holy of Holies. And to whoever would call upon the name of the Lord, you would have access to God directly. Amen? Well, that's enough to make you shout. Right? Amen? Well, to spring off of that, because the whole, man, I'll just tell you, I just hearing this music tonight just took me to a different place. Because I realized something. I want to come down on the floor right away. Listen, yesterday we were coming back. We were on an airplane and we're flying back here. And in this, and the plane's not a, it's not a full flight. And, and just I happened to catch that the weather, you know, it's getting, was getting more turbulent. It was windy. Didn't feel that way when I was driving, but I heard this. And so I'm just having small talk. This guy sits down. It's on by the window, then it's Rhonda, and then this stranger sits down beside us, right? And it's not a full plane. So this stewardess comes and says, listen, I can move you anywhere in this plane, in these vacant seats. I can put you anywhere. And he says, no, I'm fine here if they're all right with me being here. I said, absolutely, we're cool with it. So as it turns out, this gentleman is having some anxiety about flying. And, and the Lord's given me words and I have no idea. So I start talking about the last time that we went to the same location. So the last time we went to the same location, it was in January. There was a horrific uh, weather system that was coming through. It was rainy, really rainy, but the winds were were dangerous. And so we started out in, in, I don't know how many hours later, six hours later, six or seven hours later, we finally are going to get going to fly only because our pilot says this, says we've got a half hour window and we're going to take it for whoever wants to take it. Anybody else can reschedule your flight. All right. Well, we're here and we, we took it. But also who took it were five pilots. There was five other pilots sitting right away in the front of this plane. But if these guys can get on there, it's going to be rough, but it's going to be okay, right? So we get on the plane and we go. And so we think we're going to be just fine. The, the cockpit door opens before we pull away from the gate. The pilot steps out. He's got an iPad in his hand. And he says, you like guys like color, right? And he shows us the screen. And he said, everybody's like, yeah, we like color. He goes, not this color. This color on this screen tells you that this is, this is storm weather that we're going to go through. I'm going to turn on the, the seatbelt sign, and you're going to stay in your seat the entire flight. Nobody goes to the restroom. It's like, okay, he's communicating pretty clear. It's going to be a turbulent ride. And so it, he, it proved to, to not... Uh, we were impressed, if you will, with the weather going up. It was literally like getting, it looked like a cartoon, the way we were bouncing around. We got up to a ceiling where we were high enough and it wasn't horrific, but it wasn't good either. It was a rough flight. So I begin to tell this guy that's sitting in the seat with us about that flight. And when I told him about the pilot giving us the story about the colored screen, he's like, were you scared? I said, no, there was five pilots sitting in here. I thought we'd be okay. I didn't, I didn't think I would like it, but I want to get home, right? 
And so I begin to, to share with this guy. Ron and I are sitting there. In the, he's a pulmonary uh, um, therapist. And he's, so he's a professional individual. <clears throat> and he's having this conversation. The conversation turns to what I do. What is, what is my profession? I'm a, I'm a pastor. And then, it, then it's on. So now we start having this conversation, and it's spiritual, and it change, and it turns radical to where this turns out this guy was raised in the church. He's not living for God now, and uh, by the end of this flight, he's he's got my business card. He wants to keep in contact, and and he's finding some, you know, purpose for the direction of his life. He's pursuing, you know, the 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 lot of life that he's on right now perhaps isn't the right one. I tell you that because we got on this plane and we're kind of ready to relax and go home. But as soon as I seen him sit in the seat right there out of all these seats, I, I was ready for a divine appointment. Do you, do you hear what I'm telling you? I thought this is the most peculiar thing ever. And then when he said, no, I would like to stay here. I thought, whoa, this is really interesting. Well, as it turns out, the Lord feeds me this little story to tell him about aircraft because he's horrified at this plane. And so his attention was peaked at about 30,000 feet listening to the preacher because he didn't want to have any issues with God or anything else at 30,000 feet when you feel like you're, you feel like you're a badminton in, in, in the wind is the racket, right? Well, the truth of it is, that's my element. That's my element to be in those shoes. And I realized just thinking, you know why that is? Because there was a day in my life that I was lost. And I remember entering the Holy of Holies, if you will, for the first time through the blood of Jesus. And because of it, I'm so, there's always this ongoing excitement about having an opportunity to tell somebody else that God has a plan for your life. Maybe they get their mind wrapped around your days are preordained before the first one of them came to pass. Perhaps you're in a divine moment. Maybe that's even right now. Amen? So my mindset was we were traveling along and I was speaking with Rhonda and I had a, a thought that we were going to perhaps talk about tonight because of what we just encountered Easter and as important as Easter was the victory Jesus won on the cross before they took him down. When he was still on the cross and he said, it is finished in that veil tore. We had access to the Father through the blood of the Son. Amen. And so on that thought, Jesus was passionate as we should be passionate about the things of God. Amen. He was passionate enough to suffer for us on a cross. Amen. What I want to look at tonight is Jesus when he was when he was, you know, passionate about something. And it, and it was, I think, would similar to some of us, maybe, in the same kind of circumstances. There was a, a preacher that I knew years ago, and uh, I used to do auto body and, and paint. And so I worked out of a church garage, and I would go with two pastors to this shop in Addison, Illinois, it was a little wholesale body shop uh, supply store. And, and I went into this shop with these guys, and they'd, ride, they'd go with me all the time, and we'd just pick up materials. And so we're in this shop, and this pastor um, that is from the inner city, right, and uh, we're in this, in this little store, and the guy behind the counter uh, is talking to some other guy that's there getting help. And this guy is using the Lord's name in vain, just, I mean, he is dropping F-bombs all over the place in, in disgusting, disrespectful, God's name in vain manner. And so I turn and I look at this pastor, Dave was his name, I look at him, 
and he's three shades of red. I thought this guy was going to come unglued on this guy. I mean, I thought maybe perhaps hit him. It looked like it could even be that bad. But you know what it was? He was deeply offended for the disrespect for God Almighty. As I was also, but not, not to the degree he was. He was very obviously, his pot was boiling over. And, and so what we have here tonight, the scriptures we're going to look at tonight, we're going to be in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. Matthew 21, verse 12 and 13. We're going to look at three different texts, and then we'll work from there. But Matthew's Gospel, these are two different occasions that you'll hear of, but you're going to hear the, the account here in Matthew uh, verse 12 says this, Then Jesus went into the temple of God, and he drove out all of those who bought and sold in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 15 and following says this, so they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And he turned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he, and he would not allow anyone to carry their wares through the temple. Then he taught them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? but you've made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard this and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished with his teaching. Then finally, another occasion is here in John chapter 2, verse 13 through 17 says this, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold ox and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the ox, and he poured out the changers of money, and he overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So three texts there. And uh, this one's very purposeful. And I've referenced this passage in the past here where he's, he's fashioning this whip out of cords if you can imagine you know he's weaving these sticks you know back in the day when kids used to get spanked if you remember those days i remember those days and uh, there was creative ways to do so and my dad had some very creative ways usually the palm of his hand that looked like the size of a i don't know he had the largest human hand i think i've ever seen or felt but what, the fashioning of the switch, if you'd imagine, a braid of three. I've got a passage here, or a scripture rather, found in Ecclesiastics, and I just want to get your mind wrapped around it. Um, Though one may be overpowered in a, uh, by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. So if you'd imagine the, the weaving of this cord is something that's going to be persuasive. In other words, a switch... Randy, you're back there. You've probably been hit with a switch or two. Amen? Yeah. And those are, there's not, listen, those are awful because they're real narrow and they sting really bad, right? You put three of them together, you got another situation. You hear what I'm telling you? It's something that's quite unpleasant. And uh, so he was purposeful. Jesus in the temple, he was weaving together this and he made a very serious protest and he moved forward. And he drove all them animals out of there because of the content of the heart of the individuals who were inside the temple. Amen? All right, so I want to draw attention to something. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, just verse 16, he said, And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Let me just give you a picture of that. Carry wares through the temple. 
first of all, a temple is a, the temple is a sacred place. Amen. Should be. Jesus couldn't bear to see the temple courts used as like this shortcut or or through kind of a deal. Have you ever been into a you know a mall where there's a lot of different stores, a lot of different things going? On? Better probably a better picture would be a flea market. A flea market, a lot of different booths, and the people that are going to each booth in the ones operating the booth are focused on one thing, their agenda. Do you hear me? So this guy over in this booth don't give a hoot what's going on in this booth, probably doesn't like this booth because it's probably a competitor at, at some level. If nothing more than if you spend your money there, you can't spend your money here, right? And so if you can imagine this cut through, these people are using this and they have their own agendas. They were, these people that were cutting through, they were selfish, preoccupied for self-gain. Do you hear what I'm saying? They have their own thing. So they're, they're cutting through the edge of the temple, right? No one uh, should be cutting through, and no one should, should be uh, having that kind of an attitude, obviously. The temple contained four separate courts. Uh, they're separate for, from each other, and they're designed with different purposes. The temple court for the Gentiles, the temple court for the women, um, uh, the court of Israel or for men, and then the court of the priest. The court of the Gentiles refers to the outer court. You can imagine um, this cutting through, if you will. You, you ever been here on a Sunday morning when there's a large, large crowd and the back doors of the sanctuary are open? And the back doors of the sanctuary are open and there's conversations going on out there you know what happens they carry on in here don't they and so especially if there's somebody out there with a voice that carries you know rather well with with no uh, microphone uh, and the doors are open somebody could say something it could be funny and if they were to laugh and it was a quiet moment in the sanctuary you would hear it it would be completely disruptive amen well in the same way these kinds of things were going on, and Jesus didn't like it at all. And so you, you have this flipping tables in the temple. He comes in and he sees something, you know, in the, the, the attitudes of the people, so on and so forth. If you could imagine, there was a, a time that we had a band that um, came to our church there on Friar Street. And it was part of a... Um, whole week of meetings for youth. It was this outreach. It was called the Metamorphosis Tour, right? So we had this guy, Ryan Fontenay, and we had Jeremy Haynes and his band that came, right? And they were the craziest characters you've ever seen. They were very good. They were excellent, in fact, but they loved Jesus and they did freaky stuff, all right? When I say that, I mean they didn't give one hoot about what anybody thought of them. They were zoned in with God. You hear what I'm saying? So they were that, those kind of people. So I remember the Sunday morning, these guys came walking into the sanctuary without any shoes on. They had no shoes, and they came walking in, and they went up onto the, the platform, and some of the seniors that were there, I thought, were going to lose their minds, right? It was one of those things that was just like, what in the world are we looking at? I don't know, just to get your mind... Listen, what happened last week, Easter, you know, Resurrection Sunday, but the night before, or rather Friday night, you know, Friday late in the afternoon, when Jesus gave up his spirit in the veil tour, we had access to the Father. You hear what I'm saying? So listen to this. To get zoned in with that God, not man, and to have a relationship that's, that's vibrant, where you don't care about the surroundings around you, or the attitudes of others, then listen to this, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, just to give you an idea of the presence of God, right? Listen, now Moses was tending the flocks with Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God, there an angel of the Lord appeared in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw the, the bush, was though it was on fire, 
it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. I'll let that sink in for a second. For the place that you are standing is holy ground. Now this Jeremy Haynes man and old Ryan Fontenay, uh, he was a laid-back character. I'm going to tell you, there was, a, there was a youth in our church at that time. There was a youth in our church. Matt Joyner, that was sitting in that sanctuary for that metamorphosis tour with those crazy freaks that came down with bare feet, who surrendered his life to the Lord in that conference. He's now a pastor. He was a youth pastor. Now he's a pa he's a senior pastor now, right? That God got a hold of them through some crazy guys who believed they were walking on holy ground. Did you, did you hear what I'm telling you? Some guys who believed they were walking on holy ground. They believed there was a reverence. They were, they were having a reverent experience different than somebody else's reverent experience. We, we lose sight so many times of how significant it is. Jesus was turning the tables over in a temple because he's seen individuals in there that hearts were focused on self-gain. Their focus had nothing to do with God. They were going through a ritualistic experience of this is what we must do, you know, kind of like, like an obligation mentality with profit tied to it. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so when you consider what things in our life, what are the things in our life that maybe we need to turn the tables over? Or maybe the Lord would like to turn them over, just like Jesus did with these people, these merchants. What kind of things do we got going on in our life that maybe the Lord needs to turn the table on, or, or maybe we can agree with them on it, and we can turn them tables over. Maybe we can look into the behind the scenes of why I do what I do. There was a college that I went to at Judson College, and i seen a sign. I've referred to it many times. It's very impressive. It had a sign up there that said, discipline yourself so others don't have to, right? And so when you think in terms of Jesus turning the tables over in the temple, that was a spectacle, amen? He wove together this cord. He whipped these animals. He drove them out, scattered their money all over the floor. Needless to say, that was definitely a scene. But worse than that, that he had a reason to do so. And so when we consider our lives and, and look at what it is for us to get in this reverent place. I think we have to examine some things, right? Because there's two schools of thought. There's two schools of thought. Some people believe, I mean, just to consider, some people think that, you know, I can just uh, live my life whatever way I want to, and that's all right with God because Jesus died for me. Wrong answer. Or others think very legalistically that they have to oblige by this whole list of rules. And if you miss one of them, then God's going to turn his back on you. Wrong also. And so to get your mind wrapped around what is correct, you have to come back to the thinking of the veil being torn from top to bottom. And we have an access because Jesus paid for it for us. And from that place of mind, I come to a place of worship that's genuine in my heart. Amen? So, so what happens is there's an, a, a behavior that changes that's coming from within. There's circumstances that are changing that are genuine in my life. Because I see that some of the things that my motives are, that are behind the scenes, require me to flip that table in my life. I don't want that part of what I'm presenting to God. You know that song, you know, you know, the only the gift that I have suitable for a king is a hallelujah, right? So how do we, you know, when you say hallelujah, when you when you absorb that and let that 
Let that resonate over your vocal cords. Is it hollow air that's just pushing a word out because that's what we do? Or is it generated from walking in and seeing a reverent experience like the, the curtain tour from top to bottom and God saying, you're qualified, now you may enter. And so when we think about what that is for us to be qualified because of what Jesus did, my contrast to that thinking is this. When I look into the recesses of my heart and I know who I really am, I know who I really am, you know, the thoughts, the thoughts that sometimes don't stay captive in my mind and they work their way from here out of my vocal cords to be expressed. And I think, oh God, how can I be acceptable in your sight? Furthermore, if my body's a temple of the living God, which we know that it is, because the deposit that Jesus guaranteed us was the indwelling Holy Spirit on his departure. And our body became a temple of the living God. So when I think about turning the tables over in my life, it's an attitude of my heart. It's when I agree with God with what I already know. When I agree with what he tells me that's right, and I say, yeah, that's right. And then I lay before him the vocals that came out of my mouth, and with a repentant heart I say, oh, God, thank you for Jesus. And you know the next thing that generally happens is praise comes from your vocal cords. Because you know without Jesus you are doomed. Without Christ, we are doomed. But with Christ, we are qualified before God as though we've never sinned. That ought to make you shout, amen? And so when you consider, what does that look like in our lives? And, and in Scripture, where is our reference point to work with? Well, I, t I could tell you this. You know, the, the doo-doo verses I talked about a few weeks ago, Paul saying... The things I want to do, I don't do. The very things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. That's revealing our heart, isn't it? It's the, those things that I end up involving myself in that I don't, should not be involved in. And Paul said it in a way that say that this is a real struggle. Who will rescue me from that wretched heart, right? Then we go into chapter 8. And this is the game changer for all of us. This ought to change every one of our lives under the right light. You hear what I'm saying? Under the right light, not under a misconception or something like that. Under the right light. Under Paul, you hear what he said in chapter 7. Chapter 8, he says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life was set, says, sets you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh. So we don't have any condemnation when we're in Christ. Amen? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. That's another reason we ought to be shouting we ought to have a real reverent heart. We ought to really consider what tables in our life need to be flipped. What things are, are repulsive to God. In reality, as our body being a temple of the living God and, and he looking into everything that we're involved in, and we don't consider that the things that we're involved in sometimes are repulsive to him. And the cure for it is not a checklist of do's and don'ts. The cure for it is a reverence from God. Listen to Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 40 and following. said, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed a certain money holder, and one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both of them. Now, which one of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one with the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, 
but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman has not stopped has not this woman has not from the time I have entered the house stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Well let me just tell you something. So get to get this in balance. It's a matter of perspective. If you have a huge debt and it's forgiven, it impacts you large. Get very excited. Have a little debt, no big deal, as we perceive things. But in context, if you, you consider what just went on there, of the, the offering of the woman with the you know, crying, the tears on his feet and wiping with her hair, and the attitude of her heart was expressed very clearly uh, that it was deep, expression expression of love and when we think of our redemption sometimes some of us may think that we're all right and that he, God's only that our that our salvation that he's only given us a small gift wrong answer he's given you a giant gift do you hear what i'm saying the wages of sin is death eternal death but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you received redemption through the blood of Jesus, you've got a giant gift. As a result, should produce something that's genuine. Amen? So having a healthy balance, having a healthy balance of grace and mercy given by God, grace, his grace and mercy, in reverent fear, reverent fear. Reverent fear. You know, you ever been embarrassed of your behavior? Or something you've done? Only one in the back row is going to raise their hand there? I, I could, I try to raise my hands and my feet, but I'll fall to the ground. Some of you would like to see that. Anyhow. But the truth of it is, sometimes we're embarrassed of things we've done. Amen. Sometimes we don't even know what we were thinking to get us to the place that we're so embarrassed of what we've done. And so the reality of it is, when we consider what it is to receive God's grace and his mercy, undeserved favor in him, withholding what we really deserve, to receive that is difficult in lieu of what I really know about my own heart. Listen, here's where it's getting real. Because some of, listen to me, some of us in the ugliest places we've been, we know that in the right circumstances, we go there again. Are you guys with me now? So the balance, the balance that we got to have is the grace and mercy of God with reverent fear of God. Let's take us back to the temple courts. Before Jesus gave up his spirit, the curtain is back together. The curtain is back together. Prior to the sacrifice being accepted by the Father. And a priest goes in there and he had sin in his life. And we know the bell stopped ringing. They dragged him out because he was deceased before the Almighty. Did you hear me? And so when I put that together, I understand I deserve that. I deserve that because I would travel that road because I'm that stupid. Well, what? Well, uh, because I have a sin nature. And the flesh and the spirit are in conflict always. And the only way that I can be victorious, as Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the very things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. Who will rescue me? Jesus will rescue you. He'll rescue you. Why? When I have reverent fear. Of the Almighty. When I understand, although He'll forgive me in the mess that I make, I know there's tables I must turn. You know why? Because He'll forgive me, but the cause and effect, the consequences of my action will follow me. Are you with me? Are you, are you still with me? In other words, 
the cause and effect of my actions will follow me. He'll forgive me. In the same way somebody sits in the penitentiary on death row, redeemed, they're going to heaven when they take their last breath. Why? Not on their own merit, but on Jesus. But they're still sitting in the penitentiary for their actions. Are you hearing me? And so when we understand what it is to have reverent fear, I understand that if I go off the course of the road that he's called me to, not only do I miss what he's planned in advance for me to be part of, I get the consequences that go with it. I get the consequences that go with it. So when I have a healthy balance, I come up with grace and mercy, undeserved favor, and God withholding what I really deserve, and a sober respect of the curtain that was torn, the price that was paid. I understand that there's things in my life that I need to recognize with the Holy Spirit's indwelling that I need to be aware of. There's some tables I need to turn. There's some things going on in my life, maybe. Listen, I'm, I'll come down and I'll wind down because you guys get nervous. If I get revved up and then I might just keep going. The truth of it is, this reverent fear of God is something that's missing in the church today. Listen, you can, you can be involved in, with the grace and mercy of God and miss the reverent fear. And you know, you'll do dumb stuff. You'll do dumb stuff again and again and again, and you'll, you, you won't understand the magnitude of what God wants to accomplish in and through your life. And he says, listen, you need to have this relationship in sober balance. Grace and mercy, reverent fear. God is who he is, and we are who we are. He is the creator, the maker of all things. We're created by him and for him. When we get those things lined up correctly, our decisions start changing radically. I start getting really excited. Honestly, I haven't been as revved up <clears throat> as I was on that airplane in a while, speaking to a guy who needed to hear truth, generated from the mouth of somebody who recognized the veil was torn and I had access. He didn't know that. You hear me? He, he didn't know that there's a direction in life that God wants to guide you that has purpose. He wants to lead you on a road that's going to change the way you see things. The way you genuinely look and, and, and assess things as I look and say, these things are detestable to God. And therefore, I'm not going to be legalistic in the way I think. I'm going to say, I want to please the one who rescued me. And so I want to flip them tables myself. I want to show that as I agree with God. You know, when you, I just heard somebody say amen. Somebody said amen. When you say amen, you know what that is? So be it, right? You agree. That's what flipping the tables in your life is. The things that, that are detestable to God, flip them upside down. You know what you're saying? I seen it, I heard it, and now I'm doing it. I'll clean this mess up now. Why? Because we have the opportunity to do as Paul did. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the very things I don't want to do, there I find myself doing. I have the ability to walk with Christ and make wise choices. And when I recognize that I've made poor choices, I'm going to clean up the mess after I've had to turn the table over. Amen? I don't know where you're at. I always give an opportunity for people to respond. I think that that's a fair thing to do. Amen? I think that when you, when you hear something, then maybe you can hear something in your life. Now think about the outer temple courts that I talked about, of the Gentiles. You know one, one of the things with the Gentiles? The Gentiles were on the outside. They were considered unclean. All right? So the mindset, religiously of the day, would be, that's unclean, so therefore acceptable to cut, use it as a cut through. We'll cut through here, and as I'm cutting through, it's going to be just like, you know, I'm walking through Casey's. I'm having me a conversation with somebody, knocking into people, whatever else. It has nothing to do with what's going on anywhere else in that store, just for me, right? And sometimes we get that attitude as, you know, that's who you were before Christ, 
dirty. When the veil tore and we received the forgiveness of Christ, guess what? You've got his credentials and you're clean before him. You've got no business acting like some fool on the outer courts. Do you hear what I'm saying? With that comes a reverence for God. With that comes an opportunity for us to show him that we understand who we are in relation to who. We don't deserve anything. Salvation is a gift from God lest any man should boast. That's what the scripture says. But for us to embrace that is to say, I have this access because he made this possible. You've revealed to me, God, some areas in my life I need to flip the tables on because I want to honor you. And not only honor you, I want somebody else to be able to see the Christ in me. Amen? Wherever you are tonight, you can stay right in your seats tonight unless you feel compelled. I'm going to pray with you. As the music plays, if somebody's compelled, you come on up. I'll be up here. And if you want to really do business with the Lord, you want to say, you know what? It's an intimidating thing to do to get out of your seat and come up. But, man, I've got some things in my life. I want them tables turned for good. Well, let me just tell you, the last part of everything here is after the tables have been turned, you clean up the mess. You clean up the mess. Carry it out. It's no more of your life. It's not part of who you are anymore. Amen? If there's never been a time that you asked Jesus to save you, then this would be that time. Come on up and we'll have a prayer. We'll talk to the Lord about it. You'll be able to call him Abba Father. But if you've done that and you're in here and you're not in the right place, you got some things going on in your life, let's flip them tables today. Amen? As the music plays... Would you respond?